come to the Montefiore Heart Lecture from Montefiore Medical Center in New York. I am Uli Jorde. I'm the director of the heart failure program here, and it is my true great pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Daniel Sims, who is an associate professor of medicine and the director of our uh, coronary care unit here. Dr. Sims went to medical school in Atlanta at Emory, stayed there for his residency, then joined uh, Columbia University for fellowship. And we met uh, during this year of advanced training in heart failure and transplantation a few years ago now. And after which Danny returned to Emory and was then after a short time successfully recruited to Montefiore in 2012, I believe, and I immediately followed him in 2014, and we have been together here since. Uh, Danny has many publications, is an important committee of the AHA, but I believe the most important accomplishment uh, that he's made is to uh, change our CCU to the first uh, heart failure intensive care unit uh, in the Northeast, I believe, where we routinely uh, care for patients, not just with myocardial infarction and shock, but also patients on mechanical circuitry support, including ECMO and uh, durable ventricular assist devices. I believe this is the future of heart failure. So I'm very pleased uh, to again introduce Danny Sims, a long time member also of the international MSG, and I'm sure you will enjoy his presentation. Thank you, Danny. Well, uh, Uli, thank you for that uh, really uh, kind uh, introduction there. Um, so uh, happy to be back speaking. I uh, titled this uh, Cardiogenic Shock 2.0 because it's Zoom-proofed. Uh, after uh, the last uh, fiasco, uh, IT had to uh, uh, delete uh, Zoom from my computer and reinstall it to uh, get it to work properly. So, uh, so far, so good uh, today. So let's get going. Uh, so my disclosure, I'm still a Mets fan working here in the Bronx, uh, but uh, none otherwise for the purposes of this talk. Uh, today I want to go over the spectrum of cardiogenic shock, go over the goals of treatment of cardiogenic shock, and go over the available mechanical circulatory support devices, as well as assess protocol and team structure for treating cardiogenic shock. So I think it's always a good idea to start with a definition. And for cardiogenic shock, there, there are several definitions, but for the most part, it's, it's agreed upon by everyone that it's a diminished cardiac output with a cardiac index less than about 2 to 2.2 liters per minute per meter squared. There's often, but not always, hypotension with a systolic blood pressure less than 90 for greater than 30 minutes, or the need for vasopressors, onotropes, or mechanical circulatory support to maintain the blood pressure greater than 90. You should have elevated filling pressures with a wedge pressure greater than 15 to 18. This is to differentiate it from hypovolumic shock, which will give you a low cardiac output uh, and hypotension, but with a low filling pressure. And it needs to be associated with end organ hypoperfusion. In addition, there should be some clinical signs uh, to go with the cardiogenic shock. There could be altered mental status, cold, clammy skin and extremities, oliguria with the urine output less than 30 cc's per hour, and the serum lactate should be elevated at uh, greater than two. Now, in addition to defining the problem, uh, it's also important to figure out the severity. So just like with New York Heart Association classification or ACC AHA staging for heart failure or Canadian Cardiovascular Society uh, classification of angina, uh, it's important to classify cardiogenic shock we've learned. And SKY, the Society for Cardiovascular Angiography and Interventions, uh, recently came out uh, with this classification, uh, A, B, C, D, E, uh, for staging. And uh, A and B um, are not actually in cardiogenic shock. They're at risk or the beginning of cardiogenic shock. Uh, say somebody who had uh, an MI or has a bad chronic heart failure that comes in acutely decompensated would be at risk. The beginnings of cardiogenic shock is someone who's hypotensive or tachycardic, but they're not hypoperfused. Stage C would be classic cardiogenic shock, where someone has the uh, signs and symptoms uh, and hemodynamics that I just uh, went over with you. Stage D is deteriorating. So despite the initial intervention of either ionotropes or pressors or, or uh, mechanical support, they're getting worse. And then there's stage E, which is extremis. So the patient uh, is about to die uh, they're uh, 
they've got minutes uh, really to live uh, before you do something, or uh, they're actually undergoing a, a ACLS and cardiac arrest at, the, at that time. So what's the incidence of uh, cardiogenic shock? Well, this data comes from uh, Robert Goldberg in Worcester, Massachusetts, and he looked at uh, multiple uh, cardiac intensive care units in the New England area. And he found that uh, from the mid 1970s all the way through the mid 1990s, the um, rates of cardiogenic shock stayed stable at about seven and a half percent and then started to decline to a nadir in 2003 of about 4.1%. Uh, and this paralleled the use of primary uh, percutaneous coronary intervention. So almost anything that depresses the heart's ability to pump blood forward can lead to cardiogenic shock namely uh, myocardial infarction without mechanical complications, but as you might imagine, also myocardial infarction with mechanical complications, acute decompensation of chronic heart failure, uh, fulminant myocarditis, postcardiotomy shock syndrome, uh, Takasubos, the, the list goes on. But what about uh, the etiology of refractory cardiogenic shock? Namely, a patient who remains in cardiogenic shock despite vasoactive drips, despite an intraortic balloon pump. And this is data from uh, Hiro Takayama. He looked at 90 such patients, and he found that half of these patients, the etiology was acute myocardial infarction, and another quarter of the patients, the etiology was acute decompensation of chronic heart failure. So I mentioned that the incidence of cardiogenic shock complicating myocardial infarction has decreased since the mid-90s uh, due to PCI. Uh, the benefits of revascularization in the setting of cardiogenic shock were examined in the landmark uh, shock trial, and I want to go over that here. Uh, Judy Hockman was the lead author. Uh, Thierry Lejemtel, then of Einstein, uh, was the senior author, and our own uh, Mark Menegas and Rob Foreman uh, were also on this, uh, this really profound paper. And what they did is they randomized uh, 302 patients uh, presenting with uh, acute cardiogenic shock complicating a myocardial infarction who did not have a mechanical complication. And half the patients were randomized to emergency re revascularization, two thirds of which had angioplasty, another third had uh, bypass surgery. And the other half of the patients were randomized to initial medical stabilization. So they went up to the CCU to, uh, to cool off or to improve their, their cardiogenic shock and then potentially going for revascularization. Now, two thirds of these patients had thrombolytic therapy. Of all the patients in the study, both arms, 86% of the patients had an intraortic balloon pump uh, to help them with their cardiogenic shock state. And here is the, um, uh, the main figure from the paper. Uh, you see that after 30 days, survival was no different uh, between emergency revascularization and initial medical stabilization. However, there was a trend towards more patients being alive uh, if they went for emergency revascularization right away. But when they followed these patients out six months, three years, six years, uh, there was a mortality benefit that extended to the patients who got emergency revascularization. And what I think is very important about this data is that this isn't about a drug that the patient needs to take every single day for uh, three months for six years, for three years, six months. This is about the decision to go to the cardiac cath lab right away in the emergency room when you've diagnosed them with that STEMI and being in cardiogenic shock, that it has profound implications for prognosis and survival uh, that far down the road. So it's very, very important. So what's uh, new or relatively new with uh, PCI and acute myocardial infarction cardiogenic shock? Well, this is the culprit shock trial uh, published now in 2017. Uh, Olga Thiele uh, was the uh, lead author and randomized 706 patients who had acute myocardial infarction, cardiogenic shock, and multivessel disease on the angiogram. And the patients were randomized to one of two strategies. They could revascularize the culprit only with the option for stage PCI later or immediate multivessel PCI of all the um, uh, obstructive lesions. The primary endpoint of the study was death or need for dialysis at 30 days. And what you can see uh, looking at uh, the first uh, figure here, uh, or uh, uh, A, is that the culprit lesion only had 45% uh, mortality and dialysis use, while multivessel PCI was 55%. So there was a 10% absolute increase in risk uh, 
if you did multi-vessel PCI uh, for these patients. When you look at just death from any cause, uh, the bottom part, uh, you see that culprit only was 43% and multi-vessel PCI was uh, 51%. Again, about an 8% absolute risk, absolute increase in risk uh, and harm if you did the multi-vessel PCI. So as a result, um, the strategy has shifted to fixing the culprit lesion, getting out of there, and then, um, you know, if necessary later on, having the option to uh, go back for stage PCI. So how have we done with prognosis uh, over time as the shock trial was published back in uh, 1999? Uh, so again, uh, back to uh, Robert Goldberg's data from Worcester. And what we see here is the case fatality rate uh, on the uh, y-axis. And patients have uh, a case fatality rate in the mid-1970s of about 75%, which stayed stable uh, into the early 90s and then started to decrease as there was more PCI that was being done, such that by the mid-2000s, the uh, case fatality rate was about 45%. So this is a huge improvement, absolute risk reduction of 30%. However, however, still 45 patients were dying during hospitalization. So this is a, a huge, uh, hugely lethal disease uh, when patients have cardiogenic shock. Okay, so that data takes us through uh, the mid 2000s, but uh, how are we doing more recently? So uh, one of my colleagues on the AHA Acute Cardiac Care Committee, uh, Shoshandra uh, Valabia Sula, um, looked at the national inpatient sample. And what he found is that uh, mortality continued to decrease like we saw in the previous uh, slide uh, through about 2009 when it leveled off at about 40%. What you also see here from Sarshandra's data is that the more organ failure that you have, no organ failure, single organ failure, multi-organ failure, the higher the mortality, the worse prognosis for the patient. In terms of hemodynamic parameters, uh, cardiac power output was found to be the best uh, prognostic factor uh, in terms of survival. Um, this is data from uh, Robert Finicky, excuse me, Rupert Finicky uh, from the shock trial registry. And um, the cardiac power output for those who are not familiar with it is the mean arterial pressure times the cardiac output divided by a constant of 451, which converts it to the units of watts. And what you see here is that on the right, um, the patients who have a high cardiac power output greater than 1.2, their mortality is quite low, uh, less than 10%, because they have high both pressure, blood pressure and cardiac output. But as your cardiac power output gets to be less than one, you have a inverse relationship, a, a linear inverse relationship with increasing mortality um, as the cardiac power output declines, such that when the cardiac power output is less than 0.53 watts, the mortality is greater than 50%. So what about uh, sky classification? How does that help us with prognosis? Well, this is data from uh, another one of my uh, AHA uh, acute cardiac care committee uh, colleagues, uh, Jake Jenser, uh, who's one of the cardiac uh, critical care docs at the Mayo Clinic. And he looked at retrospectively uh, the Mayo Clinic's uh, admissions for cardiogenic shock over a number of years. And what you see here is that the patients for stage A, B, C, D, E, there's stepwise increase in the mortality for cardiogenic shock. And when they adjusted based on the baseline uh, parameters of the patient, there's further uh, increase in mortality such that stage E, for example, has an adjusted odds ratio of seven um, as compared to a stage A. Now, what I think is really uh, important to take home uh, from these slide, or this slide, excuse me, is the, the effect that a cardiac arrest has on the patient coming in with cardiogenic shock. So the orange bars over here are patients with cardiogenic shock who also had a cardiac arrest. And what you can see is for the early stages of cardiogenic shock, it essentially quadruples the mortality. And for stage D, stage E, it's significantly increasing mortality as well. So cardiogenic shock, bad in and of itself, but cardiogenic shock when you've had a cardiac arrest, huge mortality. So Judy Hockman has described these six patients as being in a downward spiral of cardiogenic shock. 
Um, over here, uh, we have our patients who have a myocardial infarction. And when you have an MI, you get both systolic and diastolic dysfunction. It's actually the diastolic dysfunction that's happening first. And you get an increase in your left ventricular end diastolic pressure, which leads to pulmonary uh, congestion, uh, hypoxemia, which leads to worsened ischemia, progressive myocardial dysfunction, and death. At the same time, we're having systolic dysfunction, which leads to a decrease in cardiac output, a decrease in stroke volume, hypotension, decrease in coronary perfusion pressure, which again leads to further myocardial ischemia, myocardial dysfunction, and death. When your cardiac output is being decreased, you have a decrease in systemic perfusion, and there's a reflex vasoconstriction. This reflex vasoconstriction makes that failing heart uh, have even more myocardial dysfunction, again, further spiraling to death. So this is sort of our classic pathway here for cardiogenic shock. However, at the same time, we've learned that there's a lot of systemic inflammation that's going on. When someone has a big myocardial infarction that's lysing open uh, myocytes, that's not perfusing the liver, um, we get inflammation, you get the release of inflammatory cytokines, uh, inducible nitric oxide synthetase, uh, more nitric oxide, vasodilation, and actually a decrease in the systemic vascular resistance, which further leads to worsening systemic perfusion and coronary perfusion. Again, further spiraling into myocardial dysfunction and death. So what are our goals to, to break this spiral? It's to maintain the perfusion. And I'll argue and I'll argue strongly that we need to maintain systemic perfusion first, followed by coronary perfusion. We need to prevent or reverse end organ dysfunction. You know, uh, our surgical colleagues in trauma, they talk about the golden hour that's necessary to save a patient. In the MICU, they used to talk about uh, for septic shock, early goal-directed therapy. Now, I like to talk about for cardiogenic shock, early hemodynamic goal-directed therapy. We need to raise the cardiac output, improve the MAP, or the cardiac power output, if you will, to get adequate urine output to improve the lactate and improve uh, perfusion. Now, I wanna take a few minutes and talk about uh, pulmonary artery catheters. As some people act like uh, PAC is a four letter word. Um, we learned from the landmark ESCAPE trial, which was published back in 2005, that in patients with uh, acute decompensated heart failure who were randomized to treatment uh, with clinical assessment alone or clinical assessment plus the numbers uh, from the pulmonary artery catheter, that there was no difference in survival days alive out of the hospital at six months. The curves are completely superimposable, so no improvement with the pulmonary artery catheter. And in fact, there were more adverse events in the group that got the pulmonary artery catheter, uh, more, a few more line infections and a few more ICD shocks. So the take home message became after the escape trial was that pulmonary artery catheters are bad and that they kill people and they should essentially never be used. And this is the wrong message as I was telling um, our uh, interns and residents and fellow on CCU rounds this morning. So first let's look who is not in the escape trial. So exclusion criteria, patients who had ever been on a dose of dobutamine or do dopamine uh, greater than three uh, micrograms, so that's a pretty low dose. Any prior use of milrinone during the current hospitalization, if their creatinine was greater than three and a half, or any patient where the pulmonary artery catheter is thought to be required for their heart failure management. And uh, oh yeah, one more thing. There are no shock patients in the escape trial. So these were not the patients that were uh, studied. In fact, the escape trial tells us what we now already seem to know, which is that for the average decompensated heart failure patients, we don't need a pulmonary artery catheter. However, pulmonary artery catheters are critical in post-MI shock because we need to know what's the problem uh, causing the hypotension. Is it pump failure? Is it a mechanical complication like a VSD or MR or RV failure? Is it hypovolemia that could be due to a retroperitoneal bleed? Is it vasodilation due to SIRS? Is it a combination of these factors? Pulmonary artery catheters are also critical in other etiologies of cardiogenic shock so that you can give the lowest dose necessary of the vasoactive medications which have uh, side effects and um, uh, properties that we want to avoid. Now, I used to tell um, uh, the fellows in uh, uh, conferences and their, um, their core lectures 
that you have to take my word for it uh, that you need the pulmonary artery catheter to take care of these patients. But we actually now have data to support this. So over here, I'm showing you data from uh, Joanne Lindenfeld and her group at uh, Vanderbilt. And she also looked at data from the uh, national inpatient sample. And what you can see is that since the publication of ESCAPE in 2005, a significant decrease in the use of pulmonary artery catheters for cardiogenic shock, as well as a decrease in the use of pulmonary catheters for heart failure. Um, similar to Sarshandra's data that I showed you before, the mortality for cardiogenic shock continued to decrease uh, in the mid 2000s until about 2009, where it leveled off. However, for the patients, this dashed line here who had cardiogenic shock without a pulmonary artery catheter, mortality actually increased a little bit, while mortality stayed level or decreased a little bit in patients who were managed with a pulmonary artery catheter. So there was actually an eight to 10% absolute risk reduction in mortality for patients with cardiogenic shock who were managed with a pulmonary artery catheter. Some further data for this. So this is data from Bill O'Neill presented at the ACC in 2017, um, looking at two Impella databases, the IQ database and the CVAD registry. Uh, this has subsequently been published. And what you see here is that there's a huge survival advantage uh, in both databases for the patients who had hemodynamic monitoring with the pulmonary artery catheter. So all of these patients had an Impella pump in, but if you had hemodynamic monitoring with the PA catheter, 14% improvement in survival, 8% absolute improvement in survival. This is about 14,000 patients. This is about 1,100 patients. So huge improvement. Uh, this is non-randomized data, but remember with the pulmonary artery catheter, it's not just for a therapy that's improving the patient. In fact, it's not a therapy at all. The pulmonary artery catheter is purely diagnostic. It just allows you to know what's going on and to tailor treatment appropriately. Um, so pulmonary artery catheters seem to be uh, pretty helpful um, in this mechanical circulatory support era that we're living in now, but, but what's really going on currently in the modern C uh, cardiac intensive care unit? So uh, this is data from the Critical Care Cardiology Trials Network, which is 16 uh, academic uh, cardiac intensive care units, 14 in the United States, two in Canada. And they provided a two month snapshot of data uh, from their units in 2018. And 22% of their patients uh, had um, uh, cardiogenic shock, uh, excuse me, shock uh, of any kind. And as we look here, uh, two thirds of those patients were cardiogenic shock and 20% were mixed cardiogenic vasodilatory shock. So 86% had cardiogenic shock uh, of some kind uh, plus minus vasodilatory. Now of the patients with cardiogenic shock alone, 30% uh, of them were acute myocardial infarction cardiogenic shock. And another 46% of the patients were acute decompensation of chronic heart failure. And that chronic heart failure could be due to either a non-ischemic cardiomyopathy or an ischemic cardiomyopathy. But what you see here is that for uh, patients who have acute MI cardiogenic shock or cardiogenic shock again, not within an acute MI, uh, the non-ischemics, the ischemics, that only 65 to 70% of the patients had invasive monitoring of any kind, be it either a central line, a pulmonary artery catheter, or an arterial line. And if you look at just the acute MI cardiogenic shock patients, you see that only 31% of them had a pulmonary artery catheter, despite 61% of the patients having a mechanical circulatory support device. So clearly uh, we can do better as far as um, uh, invasively assessing the hemodynamics and managing these patients. Now, first line therapy for uh, cardiogenic shock is essentially always our vasoactive drips. And we have two ionotropes, dibutamine and milrinone, followed by uh, our ionotrope vasopressors, dopamine and epi, as well as our pure uh, vasopressors, or excuse me, uh, phenylephrine and vasopressin as well as uh, norepinephrine. Now, oftentimes I see dopamine selected as the presser of choice uh, for uh, cardiogenic shock, but it really should be the third or fourth line agent. So this is data from the SOAP2 study published in the New England Journal of Medicine, 10 years old now, and it randomized nearly 1,700 patients 
to receive dopamine or norepi as first-line therapy for shock. And these are shock all comers, uh, vasodilatory, cardiogenic, uh, um, even a few hypovolumics. And what they found was that there was no difference in the overall rate of death at 28 days between dopamine and norepinephrine. About 50% of patients died uh, within a month, regardless of which uh, pressor they got first. However, there was twice as much arrhythmias, both supraventricular arrhythmias as well as ventricular arrhythmias in the patients who got dopamine as compared to the patients who got um, uh, norepinephrine. Now, in the subset of patients, the 280 patients with cardiogenic shock, as you see here, um, those patients who got treated with dopamine first had higher mortality, okay, than the patients who got norepinephrine. This was uh, statistically significant. Now, um, there are some issues with the study um, as far as the, the definitions and who was enrolled, but this really is the best data that we have, and we should use um, the best data to inform our, our treatments. So as a result, again, dopamine really should be third or fourth line therapy. Now, I don't want you to walk away from this uh, and go back to the wards and think that, well, norepinephrine is the first line therapy for cardiogenic shock, and that's what we should be using to treat cardiogenic shock. Uh, pressors are not a good treatment uh, for cardiogenic shock. And I wanna not just tell you this, I wanna prove this to you. But to prove it to you, um, we need to go over uh, pressure volume loops a little bit. So I want to just bring everybody up to um, speed so that we all uh, remember these pressure volume loops from uh, uh, pathophysiology. So we have over here, um, uh, arbitrarily, we're going to start here uh, with the onset of systole where our mitral valve closes and you hear S1. We have isovolumic contraction and then when the pressure in the ventricle exceeds the pressure in the aorta, the aortic valve opens, we get ejection of blood. When pressure in the ventricle falls below the aorta, uh, the aortic valve closes, we hear S2, we have isovolumic relaxation. When the pressure in the uh, uh, ventricle is below the pressure in the left atrium, the mitral valve opens and we get passive filling uh, and then our atrial kick. Uh, and then we get the onset of systole and the process uh, repeats itself. This vertical line over here represents end diastolic volume. This vertical line represents end systolic volume. And the width of the curve is our stroke volume. There are several other points on the curve that are important. The top point of the pressure volume loop is your systolic blood pressure. Right before uh, ejection is your diastolic blood pressure. And then your end diastolic pressure, your, your uh, gold standard for preload, is the point at the bottom right uh, of the curves of the pressure volume loop. Now, the pressure volume loop is formed by the borders of these two curves, the EDPVR, the end diastolic pressure volume relationship, which is curvilinear, and the ESPVR, the end systolic pressure volume relationship, which is uh, a straight line. And when you have increased contractility, your ESPVR will shift over here to the left. When you have decreased contractility, your ESPVR will shift over here to the right. So now that we've uh, rapidly gone through the, uh, the pressure volume loop, uh, let's take a, another look at the pressure volume loop. So this is from the Harvey program uh, created by Dan Burkhoff, which is a wonderful teaching tool uh, to understand uh, cardiac hemodynamics. And what you see here in green is a normal patient and the width of this curve is uh, their normal stroke volume. And here's your ESPVR relationship. And then I created a patient who had um, an acute myocardial infarction, cardiogenic shock, their uh, contractility, their ESPVR fell uh, acutely. And as a result of that, the patient's uh, stroke volume is much lower, okay? So to increase uh, the patient's um, cardiac output to compensate for that lower stroke volume, the patient has to have a faster heart rate of about 110 beats per minute, but it doesn't completely compensate because our cardiac output is down to 3.6 from uh, 6.0 of where it was uh, at normal. The blood pressure has decreased from about uh, 115 over 66 to about 89 over 64. And also our wedge pressure has gone up because the uh, end diastolic pressure volume relationship has shifted up because the heart has diastolic dysfunction as we talked about earlier, it's stiff. And now our wedge pressure is about 30 instead of normal uh, of 11. Okay, so this is what happens in acute MI. So 
this is what's going to happen when we give this patient uh, norepinephrine over here. So um, I just recorded this earlier. So we're going to give uh, norepinephrine um, and we're going to see what that's going to do to the patient. So remember, norepinephrine is a, has a little bit of beta agonist properties, but it also is an alpha uh, agonist. So because it's a beta agonist a little, we get a little bit of improvement in contractility and a shift upward of our ESPVR um, when we give the patient seven uh, of norepinephrine. However, we're increasing our afterload when we do that. And as a result of that, we are lowering our stroke volume. Okay, the width of the curve, the red curve, is a lot less than the width of the purple curve. So while yes, we have increased our blood pressure by giving the patient norepinephrine, we've actually increased our wedge pressure a little bit, but most dramatically, we lowered our cardiac output. So while yeah, the pressure is better, the blood pressure, we are going to be worsening the hypoperfusion of this patient which is a bad thing and the patient's gonna go into renal failure and have ischemic gut and they're gonna spiral downhill like um, uh, Dr. Hockman uh, has uh, proposed. Now, this isn't to tell you that these patients can't become vasodilated. In fact, they get inflammation and become vasodilated. So why is that? It's because of myocardial ischemia and necrosis. It's because of end organ uh, injury, as I mentioned, potentially uh, ischemic hepatopathy. Uh, these patients can become septic. Why can these patients with acute myocardiogenic shock become septic? Well, they're having a, an emergency PCI. Maybe it was less than perfectly sterile. The catheter touched something by accident. It's an emergency procedure. There can be gut translocation of bacteria. The patient can aspirate uh, when they're getting intubated uh, because uh, they're in pulmonary edema. Uh, there can be a line infection from the hemodynamic monitoring and mechanical circulatory support devices. The sedatives uh, also uh, can cause hypertension. So uh, there definitely can be vasodilation in the setting of cardiogenic shock. When we have vasodilation, we actually prefer, however, for these patients, uh, rather than using norepinephrine, to use uh, vasopressin. Why is that? It's because of some of the properties of vasopressin. I want to go over that briefly. So uh, what you see over here is that when you give escalating dosages of vasopressin, you get a nice increase in the blood pressure you get um, an increase in the systemic vascular resistance, but you really don't get much of a decrease uh, at all uh, in the cardiac index and the heart rate uh, does not go up uh, either. But what's also very important in the properties of vasopressin is that the mean pulmonary artery pressure and the pulmonary vascular resistance doesn't change, which is very important because these patients with acute MI cardiogenic shock, while they clearly have left heart failure, Many, many of them have right heart failure also, and that failing right ventricle is particularly sensitive to um, pulmonary afterload. So what do we often do for uh, these patients? We use deputamine. So again, let's look at the Harvey program. So here's our uh, patient that I created who's got cardiogenic shock. Um, again, they're, they're attacking away at 110. Their cardiac output is 3.6. And we're going to give them uh, dobutamine here in a second. So we're gonna start dobutamine uh, on this patient. And I think I gave the patient a seven of dobutamine or seven and a half, I can't remember. Seven. Um, and we see that we are shifting upwards our ESPVR curve over here. And as a result of that, we're ejecting more blood. So our stroke volume is actually increased this red curve here, the width of the curves of the loop as compared to the purple loop where the stroke volume is this wide, okay? So we've improved our blood pressure. Our systolic pressure has gone up to about 101 from about 89, but also we haven't uh, increased the wedge pressure. So this would be something that could help our patient with cardiogenic shock and not be uh, just helping the blood pressure but causing hypoperfusion. The problem is that using dobutamine Milrinone or catecholamine-based ionotropes, they cause tachycardia, they increase myocardial oxygen demand, and they increase the risk for arrhythmias, both supraventricular arrhythmias and ventricular arrhythmias. And this is uh, not a good thing for a patient having an acute myocardial infarction. As a result, um, what do we do? Well, when you're escalating your vasoactive drips, you want to think about mechanical circulatory support. So this is data from uh, Babir um, 
uh, Bavar Basir, who actually just uh, gave a lecture to uh, Montefiore um, maybe about a month ago. And he looked at um, patients who all got put on impella pump for cardiogenic shock and how much ionotrope the patient was on at the time they uh, went on the impella. And what you see is that there's much better survival if the patients weren't on ionotropes or only one ionotropes as compared to when they were on multiple drips. So the more drips that the patient's on, the, the higher dose that the drips that the patient's on, the worse they're gonna do, okay? So you need to, as soon as you're even starting one, you need to be thinking about uh, mechanical circulatory support. So what are we looking for with mechanical circulatory support? We want something we can insert quickly, something that's gonna provide excellent hemodynamic support, be myocardial protective, and have a low complication rate, especially in terms of limb ischemia, embolization, stroke, hemolysis, and infection. What affects our decision when we select the device? Well, what degree of support is required? Is this someone who um, has uh, stage C uh, cardiogenic shock, or is this someone who's stage E and in extremis and about to die? What's the duration of support that's gonna be needed? Uh, is this a patient we expect to get transplanted later that night? Or is this a patient who's gonna have to uh, wait for a couple of weeks before they can get a transplant? Uh, speaking of transplant, what's the destination for this patient? Is this someone we hope to recover? Is this someone who's gonna be transitioned to a durable LVAD? Or will they go on to be a transplant candidate? You also wanna take into account the comorbidities of the patients. What's their neurologic function? Do they have other, other end organ dysfunction already? What kind of uh, vascular disease do they have? Are they coagulopathic? Do they have an LV thrombus? which you'd want to stay away from putting something in the left ventricle. If the patient's at another hospital, are they stable for transfer? Also, um, what technology uh, does the other hospital have? Uh, here at Montefiore, we're very fortunate. We have a, a potpourri of devices that we can use, but many hospitals might only have a balloon pump, if that. Uh, they may be stuck you know, using uh, ionotropic support, only in pressors. Uh, maybe they have an impella. Maybe we need to uh, send our ECMO team to put the patient on ECMO at the other hospital in order to stabilize them and allow for a safe transfer uh, back to, uh, to Montefiore. Okay, so uh, first thing I want to talk about device-wise is the intraortic balloon pump. And what we see here is in systole, the pump is deflated. In diastole, it's expanded. And it creates a suction mechanism, making it easier for that failing ventricle to get blood out uh, of the LV. And I always like to show this slide. This is the uh, picture from the initial description by Adrian Kantoritz back in 1968 um, from uh, his paper of balloon pump. And what you see is when you actuate the balloon pump, this uh, squiggly line over here, you get a decrease in your left ventricular pressure. And when you actuate the balloon pump, and they were actually measuring the carotid artery pressure, you get diastolic augmentation. And for those who um, uh, can make it out over here, we see that the, uh, the balloon pump looks very similar to that uh, picture I just showed you uh, in the previous slide. So uh, the balloon pump uh, is usually put in the descending uh, aorta via the femoral artery. Uh, there are other uh, axillary uh, and brachial options um, uh, in certain uh, situations. But it's not that powerful a pump. It only provides 0.5 to one liter per minute of extra uh, support. Uh, it does unload the ventricle, but only a little bit. It's pretty easy and straightforward to put in, even at the bedside. Modern balloon pumps are pretty uh, easy to manage. And there's very low risk of limb ischemia or hemorrhage um, with modern balloon pumps. Okay. So uh, what's the data uh, for balloon pump use in cardiogenic shock? And the best data is the IABP SHOCK-2 study, uh, Olga Thiele again, uh, and this data is now uh, about eight, nine years old. Um, and what they did was they randomized 600 patients with acute MI cardiogenic shock. Everybody got early revascularization and half the patients uh, were put on intraoric balloon pump and half were managed without any mechanical support. And what they found is that there was no difference in survival at 30 days with uh, mortality being about uh, 40%, okay? Um, in addition, there is no difference in major bleeding, no difference in ischemic complications of the extremities, no difference in stroke or sepsis, okay? So the take-home message to the IVP shock 2 trial became balloon pumps are bad and don't use them. In actuality, though, the message should be that balloon pumps aren't bad since they didn't cause any worse outcomes. 
But overall, for patients enrolled in the trial, balloon pumps did not improve survival. But we need to look at who was enrolled in the trial. And this is a very sick population with an average blood pressure of 89 over 55. Um, and 90% of the patients were already on ionic, excuse me, vasoactive drips. Uh, so maybe this is a population that balloon pump just was too sick to help. After all, the question is for, at least in my mind, was the balloon pump doing what it was supposed to do? Did it restore the hemodynamics of the patient? Um, so this is a, a paper that I don't think uh, gets enough attention. And this is from uh, the shock trial and shock trial registry. Remember, 86% um, of patients in both arms uh, had an intraaortic balloon pump. And what they did is they uh, analyzed the patients based on whether they have what they called CRH, or complete reversal of hypoperfusion, i.e., did the balloon pump improve their hemodynamics? Did it get them to start peeing? Did it get them to improve their lactates? Did it get their filling pressures down? If it did that, then you see at 30 days, there was a huge survival advantage, which extended out one year. So if the balloon pumps does what you put it in to do, if it, you put it in and it augments the blood pressure significantly and improves the uh, markers of hypoperfusion, you're gonna have an improved outcome. So um, for those who take care of patients in the ICU and use balloon pumps, we know this, that when balloon pumps work, they work well. And going back to um, the uh, Critical Care Cardiology Trial Network, uh, we see here, you know, academic physicians, uh, they haven't cast the balloon pump away. In fact, for out of all the mechanical circulatory support devices that were used in these 16 uh, cardiac intensive care units, 72% of the devices were an intraaortic balloon pump. And in fact, this uh, cardiac intensive care unit here, uh, every single mechanical circulatory support device they used during that two month uh, snapshot was a balloon pump. And for most of the, uh, of the uh, all but one of the centers, it was, they used the balloon pump more than half the time. So there's still a very important role for the intraaortic balloon pump and it's not uh, doomed to the dustbin of history just yet. Um, Let's switch gears and talk about the impella, which is a microaxial pump that's uh, put retrograde across the aortic valve into the left ventricle. It sucks blood out of the left ventricle and via an Archimedes screw puts the blood into the uh, aorta. Uh, there's several iterations of the impella uh, that can provide anywhere between uh, one and about five and a half liters of flow. There's impella 5.5 now uh, that's placed surgically. Uh, it provides much better unloading of the LV uh, it's a little bit more complex to put in because you need to be in the cath lab and it has to be done under fluoro. Uh, it's a little bit tougher to manage, but there is definitely also increased risk of ischemia and hemorrhage. Uh, we can't put an impella in someone who's got a severe aortic valve disease or someone who's got a mechanical aortic valve and you wouldn't want to put it in someone who's got an LV thrombus. So just quickly to go over some data on the uh, impella. This is the ESAR shock study. Uh, 25 patients with acute MI cardiogenic shock, half the patients got the Impella 2.5, half the patients got a balloon pump. They were all put in after the patients had their PCI. And what they found was that the Impella 2.5 definitely improved the cardiac index, but um, it really didn't do anything in terms of survival. It's very underpowered study, but there was more hemolysis and a need for more transfusion. Small study. Another small study, but slightly larger, this is the IMPRESS and severe shock study. 48 patients with acute MI cardiogenic shock who got the Impella CP. Half the patients, the Impella CP, half the patients, the balloon pump. Almost all the patients got the devices post revascularization. And again, you can see no difference uh, in this small underpowered study in survival with the Impella CP. So just more power didn't make an improvement um, in uh, survival. There's another iteration of the Impella called the Impella RP, which provides right-sided support. Um, it goes in the inferior vena cava through the RP outflow tract and into the pulmonary artery. And this is one of our patients who had it over here and our patient with the Impella RP over here and our PA catheter coming down and looping around uh, into the RPA. The tandem heart is another uh, support device uh, that we can use. Uh, it's put in via 21 uh, French um, cannula in the femoral vein, which is snaked all the way up to the right atrium. 
and via transeptal puncture into the left atrium, it draws oxygenated blood from the left atrium out through the extracorporeal pump, and then it's put in via 15 or 17 French uh, cannula into the femoral artery. Okay. Uh, the tandem part can provide up to five liters per minute of flow. It unloads the LV, but indirectly as it's unloading the left atrium. It's uh, more complex to implant because you need to do a transeptal puncture. It's a little bit more complex to manage. And again, there's significant risk of uh, limb ischemia and hemorrhage. Uh, you want to avoid putting this in a patient who's got a known uh, left atrial thrombus. Um, tandem heart, what's the data with that? This is a small study, again, Holger Thiele, who's one of our thought leaders on uh, cardiogenic shock. Uh, 41 patients with acute MI cardiogenic shock randomized to the tandem heart uh, versus the intraavic balloon pump. About half of the patients in each group uh, had the uh, pumps put in before uh, the PCI and about half after. And what do we see is that the cardiac output uh, significantly improved uh, compared to the balloon pump when you had the tandem heart put in. Uh, the wedge pressure went down more, the pulmonary artery pressure went down more, and the lactates decreased further, okay? But 30-day mortality, no difference, about 44%. So very similar across all these different studies is mortality anywhere between 40 to 50% at 30 days. But what you also want to know about this study is that seven out of the 21 patients who had the tandem heart had limb ischemia versus zero of the patients who had the intraoric balloon pumps. So definitely a higher risk of um, limb ischemia. But also look at the, uh, the transfusion needs and bleeding. 19 out of 21 patients needed a blood transfusion in the group that got the tandem heart versus eight out of 20 in the group that got the balloon pump. But not just that you know, more people had uh, a need for blood transfusion. Look at the interquartile range here. Uh, the amount of blood that they needed, 3.8 to 16 uh, units of blood for the, um, uh, the tandem part group versus zero to two units in the interquartile range for the uh, balloon pump. So a lot more complications for the impella, a lot more complications for the tandem part. Um, as you can see here by these small studies. There's also a uh, right ventricular support uh, iteration of the tandem part. Uh, it's actually using the same pump, but it uses a different catheter, what we call the, or what's called the Protec Duo, which gets put in uh, through the right internal jugular vein. Uh, and you can see it here, and it goes down through the RV outflow track and up into the pulmonary artery. Um, and it can provide a right-sided support and be taken out uh, percutaneously when no longer needed. Um, let's talk about uh, VA ECMO, uh, which is sort of our big gun, uh, biventricular support, respiratory support. Uh, it can be put in uh, peripherally, it can be put in uh, centrally uh, in the operating room, and it draws blood out of the um, uh, right atrium uh, through a cannula. Here we see peripheral cannulation. It's run through a rotary pump and through an oxygenator, and then blood is streamed back in via the femoral artery. Um, VA ECMO uh, can provide up to five liters per minute of flow. Unlike all our other pumps, it doesn't unload the LV at all. In fact, it increases LV afterload. Um, it's uh, in some ways easier to put in, in that it can be put in at the bedside um, and doesn't need fluoroscopy, although fluoroscopy helps, but it is and can be difficult to manage. And then there is significant risk for bleeding and ischemia and hemolysis. Uh, since the uh, uh, late 2000s, there's been a, a significant increase, uh, exponential increase, I would say, in the use of um, uh, ECMO uh, in the adult population. So what's the data uh, on ECMO? So randomized studies are not published yet, uh, but there's uh, many case series and um, meta-analyses. So this is uh, Hiro Takayama's data again, 90 patients, severe refractory cardiogenic shock despite vasoactive drips. Uh, an intraortic balloon pump, a quarter of the patients were actively getting CPR. Uh, half of these patients received VA ECMO. The median time of support was eight days. And what they found was that 53% of their patients were able to survive to the next destination. What was that next destination? Uh, exchanging the, the uh, ECMO for a durable LVAD, recovering the heart uh, and explanting completely, transplanting the patient, okay? And then again, about uh, half the patients died. Now, of these 
um, you know, uh, uh, essentially all of them uh, who were able to survive to the next destination survived the hospital discharge. So for all these patients who were in extremis and otherwise dying, uh, half the patients could be saved uh, with VA ECMO. So I mentioned that uh, VA ECMO uniquely uh, increases afterload compared to the other support devices. So here's our patient with cardiogenic shock and our stroke volume. Here's the width of this blue curve. And when we actuate the ECMO pump and increase the um, liters per minute of flow that we're providing, we're decreasing our stroke volume of the heart. The orange curve has a lower, a smaller width than this gray curve and has a much smaller width than this um, uh, burgundy curve over here. And uh, the patient has lower stroke volume and more afterload. What can this look like? Well, here's a patient uh, who was early on in the cardiogenic shock course uh, due to fulminant myocarditis. Uh, patient has a normal size cardiac silhouette. There's just some pulmonary venous congestion. But then after they had their ECMO and impella in, but not set appropriately, the patient has white out uh, of the chest x-ray. They're in fulminant, uh, a florid pulmonary edema, I should say. What do we do? We can increase the speed of the uh, impella and you can decrease the flow on the ECMO. And just a few hours later, the uh, lung parenchyma looks much, much better. So the afterload uh, caused by the ECMO as well as uh, not unloading or offloading the LV uh, with the impella uh, was causing the problem. So ECMO has got a lot of complications associated with it, namely hemorrhage, thrombosis, uh, embolism. Uh, you can get infection, limb ischemia, uh, compartment syndrome. Uh, it's very complicated uh, and uh, uh, pump that uh, you need to know what you're doing. So we need to size up the patient and the shock quickly to uh, figure out what to do for them. We need to find out how severe is the cardiogenic shock. We need to stage them uh, in terms of sky staging. We need to put in a PA catheter. Is it cardiogenic shock alone or is there vasodilatory shock or hypovolumic shock as well? Is it LV failure, RV failure, or both? Um, do they need pharmacologic support with ionotropes? And is there some vasodilation that requires vasopressors? What kind of mechanical circulatory support do we need? And then we need to reassess the hemodynamics frequently. We can't just uh, put it in and then get them up to the CCU and check again in the morning. We need to treat the other medical issues that arise, the respiratory failure, the renal failure, the coagulopathy, the infection, et cetera. The timing of the MCS is important. As you might um, uh, have gotten a feel from um, uh, the earlier slides, early placement uh, seems to be a key to breaking the spiral. In the IABP SHOCK2 study, only 13% of the patients had the balloon pump implanted pre-procedure. In the ESAR SHOCK study, no patients had the mechanical circulatory support device implanted pre-procedure. You know, with um, myocardial infarction and STEMIs, we talk about door to balloon time, but with these cardiogenic shock patients, we really should be talking about door to unloading time or door to adequate hemodynamics times because we got to support the hemodynamics uh, and maintain systemic perfusion. So uh, this is again, data from uh, Babar Basir, um, looking at the CVAD registry and comparing patients who every one of the patients got an impella pump, but the red curve, it was implanted before the PCI, the blue curve, it was implanted after the PCI. And what you see here, there was improved survival at 28 days if the patient had uh, the impella put in before the PCI. Now this is non-randomized data, but in fact, these patients here uh, were sicker. Uh, they had more comorbidities, they had lower blood pressure. Uh, in fact, the reason that the operators chose to put the pump in before the PCI is they thought they were way too sick to be able to even do the PCI without having the hemodynamic support. So what else improved survival uh, with cardiogenic shock? Well, possibly protocols. So Bill O'Neill launched the Detroit uh, Cardiogenic Shock Initiative a number of years ago to protocolize the treatment of cardiogenic shock patients. And with single arm data compared to historical controls, it looked like there was improved survival when treating patients with a cardiogenic shock protocol. So this led them to rebrand the, the DCSI as the National Cardiogenic Shock Initiative. And again, with single arm data, they showed improved survival with mortality of only 28%, okay? Now, I don't know uh, how well it shows up over here on your screens, but this uh, makes use of um, 
uh, a protocol that was very heavy on early deploying uh, of an impella, uh, doing a right heart cath and the, um, uh, the PCI, as well as um, uh, treating the patient, adjusting uh, the treatment based on the hemodynamics. Now, um, again, I believe in the concept of early hemodynamic support, but I would have been um, you know, very interested to see what would have happened with this protocol um, if, uh, say, there was an arm for the balloon pump or tandem part, because uh, I don't think it's just Impella that's making the improvement, but you know, treating the hemodynamics and supporting them uh, quickly. So uh, in addition to protocolizing cardiogenic shock care, um, who takes care of the shock patient has become a hot topic with the development of shock teams. And this is data from uh, Yosef Taleb and our own Miguel Alvarez uh, from Stavros Dracos's group in Utah. And they looked at 123 patients after they established the shock team, which was composed of uh, heart failure cardiologist, interventional cardiologist, um, cardiac surgeon, as well as a critical care doctor. And they compared their patients to uh, 120 patients prior to their shock team development. And what you see here is that they improved their survival with mortality only 25% um, uh, versus mortality of 40% uh, when the patient's uh, pre-shock team. Now, many other uh, centers have developed or developing uh, shock teams. So what are we doing here at Montefiore? Well, uh, what we've decided to do is staff, as uh, Dr. Yuri alluded to, our cardiac intensive care unit with a heart failure specialist and turn it into a heart failure cardiac intensive care unit. So we looked at our data here after we made the change in our staffing uh, patterns, and we examined close to 3,000 patients, 12% of which, 277, had a diagnosis of cardiogenic shock. And uh, in our open unit model that we had before compared to our closed unit heart failure specialist model, uh, very similar use of devices. We used 85, 91% uh, of our devices were the intraortic balloon pump. So we were not uh, what I would call an impella heavy uh, institution. And our overall mortality, all comers, decreased from eight and a half to 6.4%, uh, which was statistically significant. So uh, all comers, no matter what your diagnosis, mortality improved in our cardiac intensive care unit. But when we looked at our sickest patients, our cardiogenic shock patients, mortality improved from 37% to 25% when they were managed by a heart failure specialist. And then when we looked a priori at the patients with cardiogenic shock who had a mechanical circulatory support device, so the sickest of the sick, odds ratio of 0.6, so 40% less death in these patients who were managed uh, by the heart failure specialist in our cardiac intensive care unit. We presented this data at ACC uh, a couple of years ago and uh, currently of uh, the uh, manuscript submitted for publication. And we're very uh, proud of these results. So in conclusion, to finish up here, despite improvements over time, mortality from cardiogenic shock remains high, okay? Invasive hemodynamics with a pulmonary catheter are necessary to optimally care for our patients with cardiogenic shock. Current all comer randomized data has failed to demonstrate proven survival benefit for our temporary mechanical circulatory support devices. So the improvement in hemodynamics that we see do not equal improvement in survival. And earlier placement of the mechanical circulatory support device seems to be necessary to prevent and reverse the hypoperfusion and the spiral of cardiogenic shock. And very important is that expertise in caring for cardiogenic shock patients is key. And that expertise can be deployed either via protocols, a multidisciplinary shock team, or as in our case, a heart failure staff uh, cardiac intensive care unit. So I'm gonna stop here um, and say on behalf of our um, fantastic uh, cardiac intensive care unit nurses, as well as our uh, heart failure transplant and LVAD team, uh, I want to thank you for uh, the opportunity to present here today, as well as uh, your guys' uh, attention. So thank you very much. Yes, thank you, Danny. That was uh, exceptional uh, and so comprehensive. I was just looking back um, when I was a fellow at Weiler in uh, 1999. I graduated from there. Uh, we had the butamine and the balloon pump, and that was it. And, and here we are 20 years later with uh, an incredible portfolio of devices.
Um, I don't see any questions in the chat, uh, but uh, let me just uh, present you with a, an everyday situation for us uh, when we receive patients from elsewhere. Somebody calls you from the outside and reports that uh, you have a 55-year-old man who comes in with a myocardial infarction and is in shock with a pressure of 70. He got levofat and now it's 90. Uh, what do you tell the uh, referring physician? Um, what questions do you ask? Sure. So, uh, you know, I'd like to find out, um, you know, uh, how far away the patient is. Can we get the patient over here? Um, is this someone who um, uh, has a, um, uh, is this an institution that has a cath lab? Uh, or is it a place that only has uh, the ability to use vasoactive drips? Uh, some places uh, actually don't even have dobutamine. Uh, and, you know, norepinephrine is the only thing they have. So that's the only way to get some beta agonist support. Uh, but if their rhythm has been relatively okay, uh, you know, can we uh, start them on some dibutamine? But, uh, you know, it's not just they're on norepinephrine, but how much norepinephrine are they on? If it's just a little bit um, and uh, the patient is mentating, that the patient is making urine, uh, and that the patient is uh, not looking like they're in extremis, uh, can we get them uh, over to our cath lab quickly? And if not, or the patients, again, on uh, high doses, what we might call rocket fuel, uh, is this uh, someone that we're going to have to send our team out there uh, to put the patient on ECMO or uh, mechanical circulatory support to allow for a stable transfer? Ideally, we want to get this patient revascularized quickly, but if the patient is going to spiral down and um, you know, go into extremis before the patient can even get to us, uh, that's um, uh, not going to work. Excellent. Yeah, this is exactly what I was fishing for, uh, this answer. Uh, the calls that we get often and after your beautiful illustration of shock and the phases of shock, this is a patient in an early phase with a myocardial infarction with a low EF who probably will do well uh, in the absence of arrhythmias on the butamin. Uh, patient has now arrived in the unit. It's 2 a.m. and Dr. Sims is on call. Uh, and they call you and they said, patient's here, um, he's not really making urine, uh, he's on levofat five and uh, dibutamine three. What's our next move here? Yep. So, so, this is a, so this is a great question um, that, uh, you know, the, the interns, residents, fellows are, are calling me uh, constantly with. And so, you know, the, the, the next question is, so, so the patient's in shock, you know, what kind of shock? You know, what are the hemodynamics? And this is where the expertise in understanding uh, hemodynamics and the pulmonary artery catheter numbers and when they're reliable and when they're uh, just errors in the measurement uh, are, are so important because we need to know, uh, is the patient not making urine because they're just in ATN, but we have adequate perfusion uh, right now that we the um, uh, cardiac index is uh, 2.3, and the patient's uh, SVR now on the um, uh, little bit of levofed uh, is uh, 1,000 or 1,100, uh, which is adequate, and we sit and hold tight, and the patient may just need uh, dialysis if the you know, filling pressures are rising and they're not oxygenating well. Um, or is this a patient who's still in a hypoperfusion state? in which case uh, their PA sat is low and their, their cardiac index is still low, in which case we need to escalate uh, the uh, mechanical support for the patient um, and you know, replace the balloon pump uh, with either um, a more powerful uh, impella device or uh, ECMO. Um, you know, tandem part is also something that can be done. Our institution uh, tends not to use tandem part, but there, there's many institutions that yeah, excellent. I think well. so listening to your talk, what, what I learned is uh, use the butamin early if you can, uh, place the swollen gans early if you can, and then, of course, uh, consider ECMO early uh, if you can. So really uh, forward thinking, uh, making a plan, what if something goes wrong? I think uh, we are restricted here in time because of the YouTube recording. So I'm just going to say thank you so much, Dennis, for an exceptionally comprehensive, great lecture. And uh, everybody else, uh, thanks for listening. And I believe there will be a terrific lecture next Friday. And we're going to sign off also 